Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. So this week's topic we'll be discussing is swindling and adulteration. So the idea that kind of swindling in the wine industry has been around forever um, and I've been reading a lot of different books and it always pops up in everything and I've kind of been able to divide it into a couple of categories. So one is swindling to kind of make things last and um, to kind of puff up the wine and, and sell less wine but give people more. Um, and then the other idea is to trick. So to trick kind of um, people into thinking that your wine is different than it is. Um, the next one is to correct. So if you kind of have um, a bad wine to try to, you know, put it up, put it up a level um, and get it to taste a little bit better so you can charge more. Um, and then the last one is to conceal. So if something went wrong in the wine or if something was kind of done to the wine that you weren't aware of but now you have to kind of conceal it before the customer gets to it. Um, these are kind of the different categories that I've looked into and let's get started. So in terms of making wine last longer, this was generally when people were trying to take advantage of um, an uneducated palate, as they put it. So kind of in the city wine shops and taverns and when you were selling to kind of the broader market, this was a very desirable market because it basically took so much less capital in the beginning rather than having to age your wine and everything like that. It was, it was the mass production of um, Roman times. And so these were to these big taverns and they used to put things you would not believe in this wine. Uh, they put sugar, okay, we believe it, um, but they would also put um, flower essences, believe that too, and iron filings. So clearly they were doing a lot of taking advantage of this kind of uneducated palate as they put it. Um, and also a big thing was that they would have what was called close cellar jumblings. And these close cellar jumblings were taking advantage again of these taverns in the cities because the taverns, they would kind of have these big um, vats or dolia or amphora, whatever the size of the place, and those would kind of be in some crowded cellar and they might be under the ground. And so when somebody was pouring in a certain wine that was supposed to be nicer or supposed to be less nice maybe it got jumbled in with the other wine but it was always sold at a higher price so this kind of like blending and not taking responsibility for it um, was generally done in the taverns now next up we have tricking so this is tricking people into thinking that your wine is better than it is when it really isn't. So um, the things that they put in, the biggest thing that was put in, which actually resulted in a law against anybody doing this, was salt and salt water. So like sodium chloride just being put into the wines at such a rate because the kind of fabricators of the wine thought that this made their wine seem older and more complex, which meant that they could charge a lot more for it. And they also put in powdered marble to make the wine also seem more complex, which is truly disgusting as well, kind of on the same level as iron filings to me. Um, and the other thing they used to do was correct the wine. So in an effort to correct the wine that was, say, coming from Africa that might have been deficient in acidity, they would just squeeze limes into it or they would put something like gypsum into it. So this kind of idea of trying to correct the balance um, of different things like mouthfeel and um, acidity and all these things, and they would just have their own remedies. And then the last one is concealing. So the wine traders of Marseille were known for being particularly awful um, in adding in all kinds of herbs and drugs and all kinds of things into the wine. And the people who were supposed to be selling this wine didn't want to sell it with it tasting like that. So even if they were going to buy it, they needed to do something to make sure that it didn't taste as though there were herbs and drugs in it. Um, so they actually added aloe. And this got on Pliny's nerves to no end because he just thought that this was the worst thing you could do and the worst adulteration of wine. But 
it did kind of mask the other um, additives that were in there and also it masked because all the wine from Marseille, almost all of it, was smoked in order to make it seem older and to give it color. So all this was done to the poor wine of antiquity. Um, and also they didn't just do things to the wine, they did things to kind of the containers. So they would smoke them just like they smoked um, some of the wine in Marseille, they would smoke them because that made them seem dirtier and older um, and they would put, their, there was one tale about a cobweb factory that would make cobwebs just so that you could place them on your wine container and make it seem like it had been in a cellar. Um, so that's kind of dishonest now, isn't it? Um, and so they did all kinds of things like this. Um, and in addition, they also did things when kind of the wine was being made. So chaptalization, um, which is kind of adding, in essence, like sugar to wine. Um, so if they had a truly, truly terrible vintage, instead of kind of admitting that they had a terrible vintage, they would go into like panic mode and they would boil down like so much of their wine so that it was maybe like a third of what it was um, and that was called disfrutum or half of what it was um, and that was called sapa and or if you were um, if you were calumella you just called it all disfrutum but Pliny kind of differentiated um, and this would kind of save your vintage for the year um, but would also kind of alter the way that it tasted based on what you actually had um, so there was a lot of dishonesty going on and that actually kind of made its way up the chain to the government, uh, kind of governors of Rome who got into this whole corruption scheme with the wine trade. The wine trade was kind of like the stock market of the day where you could either make a ton of money or you could go completely bust. So this definitely attracted a lot of corruption and it actually got so bad um, that lots of these governors need to hire lawyers because they got embroiled in these wine scandals and it was just a terrible terrible thing um and then i want to tell you a story about one in particular a wine swindler that was so bad that we still actually talk about him today if you're me or another wine historian or you now um and his name was mana and he was one of those infamous Marseille wine merchants and he had an office in Rome and they said that his wine was so filled with poison that he avoided at all costs going into any cities where he sold his wine lest he should have to even take a, a sip of it because it was just unfit for drinking. There were so many poisons in it that you could never, he wouldn't even consider drinking it. So he kind of stayed out of the cities um, that he exported to. And it was said that the only thing people could possibly use his wine for was stew. So they would just put it in stew instead of drinking it themselves. And it was said that he would smoke every last drop of wine that was his. And so we still know of him today in the most horrible way possible. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this rather saucy lecture on, um, you know, wine swindling. And I will see you next week. Cheers!